Hello, I'm Africa 54 Managing Editor Vincent McCorry in for Ashtag the Uwat. It's Friday, August the 18th. Uh, this is Africa 54. The West African bloc ECOWAS says it's ready to intervene militarily if all else fails in an effort to reverse a coup in Niger. Campaigning reaches fever peach in Zimbabwe as the country counts down to its elections. The youth are demanding jobs and an end to corruption. And in our Friday entertainment report, Heather Maxwell brings us the music of Sierra Leone's Telem and Common Sound. All this and much more coming up on today's Africa 54. West African military chiefs have ended their discussions on Friday in Ghana as they prepare for a possible military intervention in Niger, which ECOWAS has threatened to launch if Niger's junta leaders fail to peacefully negotiate a return to constitutional order and return democratically elected President Mohamed Bazoum to power. For more on the situation in Niger, here's Eduard Baran. West African bloc ECOWAS stands ready to intervene militarily if all else fails to reverse a coup in Niger, the senior official said on Thursday. Commissioner for Political Affairs, Peace and Security, Abdel Fattah al Musa, said the valiant forces of West Africa are ready to answer the call of duty. That was as he addressed army generals from member states who were meeting in Ghana. By all means available, constitutional order will be restored in the country. And this meeting today, best testimony to that. Military officers in Niger deposed President Mohamed Bazoum on July 26. They've defied calls from the United Nations, ECOWAS and Western powers to reinstate him. That prompted West African heads of state to order a standby force to be assembled. Musa listed past ECOWAS deployments in Gambia, Liberia and elsewhere as examples of readiness. He also accused the junta of playing cat and mouse with the bloc. They are pretending, you know, that oh now they are ready for talks. But even us, they are telling them that they are ready for talks. They are still seeking reasons, reasons to uh, justify an unjustifiable coup d'état. Musa also strongly criticized the junta's announcement that it planned to put Bazoum on trial for treason. The United Nations, European Union and ECOWAS have all expressed concerns over the conditions of his detention. The junta has said it's open to talks to resolve the crisis. In Niger's capital, Niamey, large crowds have taken part in protests against ECOWAS and in favor of the coup leaders. Demonstrators accuse ECOWAS of being manipulated by foreign powers and say they reject outside intervention. Edward Barron of Reuters fired that report. Now, for deeper analysis on the ECOWAS threat of military intervention and the apparent and compromising stance by Niger's junta, I'm joined by Nyaka Lagoke, Professor of African Studies at Lincoln University, Pennsylvania. Welcome, Professor. Now, we've heard the ECOWAS saying, by all means possible, the constitutional order will be returned in Niger. Do you see them carrying out their threat? Uh, they seem to be serious. And then, uh, despite uh, a popular opposition to the, uh, to the military intervention, uh, they seem to be serious. Uh, so that we will see. Now, what will that look like if you can kind of uh, uh, give us uh, perhaps a sense of things based on the history of uh, military interventions in West Africa? Oh, uh, first of all, I, uh, I, you know, I've, so I've followed some of the military interventions, uh, uh, but I don't know how uh, they will go to a military base uh, because the presidential palace uh, according to what I know, is either uh, next to a military base or uh, inside the military compound uh, of the presidential guard. This is where Bazoum is supposed is supposed to be with uh, many other dignitaries. So I don't know. It looks like one of those uh, Hollywood movies that we're going to see. Uh, they will go there and somehow they will extract Bazoum from that area and then take over the military junta and replace them and put Bazoum back to power. Uh, we want to be able to see that. But we, what we know for sure 
it's going to be bloodshed if they go there. Uh, contrary to the coup that deposed Bazoum, which was a bloodless coup d'etat. And people have to also understand that it was a bloodless coup d'etat. No blood was shed, and they want to go there and kill civilians and some soldiers in order but, to restore what they call a constitutional order. But, I definitely you know, do not agree with that approach. But at the same time, remember, this was a, a democratically elected president. This has been a, literally an attempt to overthrow the Constitution. Uh, what could be the best approach if the military uh, intervention would be avoided and bloodshed, of course, avoided? Yeah, but, you know, people, they, when people talk about, first of all, uh, it was, we cannot say that Niger was living one of the best democracies of the world. We have to be, we have to know that. And electoral democracy is not the full expression of democracy, number two. Number three, what is at stake today in Africa? The reason why you see people take to the street, because there are deeper conversations, there are deeper issues than the, the mere electoral democracy. And those issues are... Uh, the reconquest of the, the African economic and political sovereignty, the fight against neocolonialism, and then, then the, the right for African countries yeah. you know, to, to have different partners. But, but, but at the same time, Professor, you know, some would say if you allowed this to hold, this coup, then it, it, it continues that uh, uh, you know, concept that whenever people are not happy with a, a civilian government, they just have to overthrow the government. I don't think... My, my point is that it's not like we support coup d'etats. It's not like I support coup d'etats. But those African countries, many of them are failed states. And if you take those francophone African countries, you're going to have between 40 or 50 percent of people in each of those 15 countries who are living in poverty. And the leaders are not delivering and they are not doing what they're supposed to do. A military coup is not the root cause of the issues. It is an outcome of a particular situation of, uh, of that, that, that many people are, are living under. Number two, if today uh, there is a, let's say Nigeria goes there and they do the, they do the war and they're successful. Tomorrow, if there is a military coup in Nigeria, what do we do? If there is a military coup in Ivory Coast, what do we do? So those people have to take that into account too. It's not by that war that they think that they're going to prevent coup d'etat in Africa. This I can tell you that now. Now, are we going back in time? The military coups had become a thing of the past. Quickly, please. No, no, no. That's, the, that's, that's what I'm saying. You can, you, it, 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 the military coup cannot be things of the past if people are not doing the right thing. That's what I'm trying to say. So there was a time the military coups were bloody. Today, they are bloodless. At least people can see an evolution. In the case of Mali, that I know a little bit more, you can see that for the last two years, Mali seems to be on a different track, which is a little bit better than what it used to be under the so-called democratically, democratically elected Ibrahim Baba Keita. So that's also well, something people have to take into account. We just hope for peace. Uh, thank you very much, uh, thank you. Nyaka. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you uh, for the opportunity. You're welcome. Nyaka Lagoke is a professor of African studies at Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. Now, the fighting in Sudan is a complex issue with no easy solutions. At its core is a power struggle between two powerful men, Abdel Fattah al-Burhan and Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo, who are both determined to control the country. Uh, the United Nations official says that Sudan has descended into a full-blown humanitarian catastrophe. The months-long armed conflict is worsening the, country, uh, the country's dire humanitarian conditions as millions of people scramble for food and safety. The outcome of the conflict is uncertain but it will significantly impact Sudan's future. You know, for more insights, uh, viewers Paul Ndeho spoke to Edgar Githua, an international relations security and diplomatic expert at the U.S. International University in Nairobi. Sudan has, is a country that has gone through very many coups from, its, for, for, from, its, from the time it got its independence. It got its coup in 1959, got coups many, many years coming down the road up to the last coup that was the major coup in 89 that brought Omar al-Bashir into power. Now, Bashir came into power and realized very easily that the same way he came through the force of the gun, somebody else could overthrow him. So over the years, he created the RSF forces. There were the former Janjaweed militia that were opened, operating in Darfur. But he elevated them to a quasi-military status 
in what we call coup proofing, just to ensure that he does not get kicked out of power. So the RSF was the counterbalance to the Sudan army under Burhan. So Bashir was able to use divide and rule between these two military leaders and keeping them in checks and balance to his own advantage. But right now, the biggest problem in Sudan is that the power struggle between Burhan and Dagalo is on who is going to play a more prominent role in post independent in a, in a either post civilian government or in the Sudan going forward. Uh, my analysis on the issue is that what is disturbing these two leaders is that they are not sure of the role they will play going forward in the governance of Sudan. If someone can assure them that their positions as two independent military leaders will not be touched, I have a feeling the situation will de-escalate and there will be a greater chance of peace coming into Sudan. There's a lot of external interference in the Sudan conflict. It is a proxy war. We have Ra we have uh, Egypt inside there, we have the United Arab Emirates inside there, uh, we have Russia inside there, we have Libya inside there. All these countries have different things that are at stake. For the Russians, the Wagner Group, it's the, it's a trade, it's a gold they deal with. The United Arab Emirates is their access to the port that they want built at Port Sudan. Uh, the Russians also want access to the port to Port Sudan because they want to build a big naval base. So we have all these. Egypt is worried that they want uh, Burhan to remain in power because of the Ethiopian dam, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. So Sudan is one of those conflicts in Africa that has a lot of external influence. That's an interesting uh, angle that uh, you bring in. Uh, when you look at uh, the players uh, who are already there, they're all there for a reason. And so how are they going to be kicked out? Uh, there's no army, no force that can literally go in there and try to stop these guys. It's true. You're right. And that's in international relations, we usually say there is no global overacting power who can... We don't have any global police force that can arrest whoever is breaking the law. This needs to come. This is concerted effort. I believe with or without the veto power, I believe the UN Security Council taking up this matter seriously can decide uh, to pass very serious resolutions that can have far-reaching implications, especially on Libya, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates. Russia is a different ball game. I understand they are a veto power and they are a, power, they are a great power in their own right. But at least let us start with all these other smaller regional interests. You know, tell them to back off. And once we get the external actors to back off, I believe Dagalo and Burhan might agree to cease and de-escalate the situation and be able to sign a cessation of hostilities agreement and come, so they can come to a ceasefire. That was Vioes Pondi who's speaking to Edgar Gidua, an international relations, security and diplomatic expert at the U.S. International University in Nairobi. Now, political parties in Zimbabwe are bracing for the country's general election on August 23rd. That will pit uh, President Emerson Munangagwa against Nelson Chamisa of the Citizens for Coalition for Change Party, along with nine other candidates from Harare. Kolomos Mavunga has our report. Election campaigns are in full swing, aimed at youth who make up more than three quarters of Zimbabwe's population. Voters like 24-year-old Bridget Mabanda. We want things to change as youth. As you can see, we are suffering from Zimbabwe. We are suffering. Everything is upside down. We are in potholes. Our money is unstable. And even our education, you can see from the fees that we are, we are, we are paying, uh, it's not affordable to us as comparing to what our parents are earning. We want a better Zimbabwe. We want our future to be bright because of this person. I think when I'm going to vote, I'm going to vote wisely concerning this. I want a better Zimbabwe. Bridget's generation has only ever known a Zimbabwe mad in economic crisis, sky high inflation, and chronic unemployment. UNICEF estimates the unemployment rate among Zimbabwe's youth is at 35%. Although official unemployment figures inside Zimbabwe are hard to come by. Some young people turn to Zimbabwe's growing informal economy for work. The person I'm voting for, firstly, he must stop corruption. Then the hospitals should have medicines and get enough salaries. 
police should do their job properly and the thieves get caught. In addition, the children should be well taken care of so they don't do drugs and they get employed easily, take care of their parents, and jobs should be created. Zimbabwe is one of the highest inflation rates in the world, topping 175% last month according to government statistics. President Munangagwa has promised to revive the economy should he win a second term. His 10 election competitors for the presidency are trying to capitalize on what they see as a Zimbabwe spectacular economic meltdown during ZANPF's 43-year rule. Munangagwa's main rival, 45-year-old Nelson Chamisam from the Citizens Coalition for Change, or Triple C, appears to have tapped into the youth's frustrations. He has promised an end to corruption and economic decline. From Harare in Zimbabwe, Columbus Mafunga for VOA Africa. Well, still to come, some of Sierra Leone's finest musicians jam for Heather Maxwell. We'll be right back. We joined many of our youth across the continent in celebrating the completion of their secondary school education over the summer. But as they set their sights on their next academic adventure, there looms the ever-rising cost of pursuing higher education, both at home and abroad. On this week's episode of Our Voices, we'll shed light on the pressing issue of the rising cost of higher education. We will hear expert opinions and explore innovative solutions to accessing quality education. Join the conversation each week right here on Our Voices. In times of change, when the world seems uncertain, and what we hear doesn't reflect what we see. We seek the truth. When we are told only part of the story, we lose trust. In moments of crisis, our dreams, hopes, and wishes for a better tomorrow depend on a free press. At Voice of America, we bring you the stories that people take risks to see. We connect the world and unite it with truth. At Voice of America, we show you the whole picture. You're watching VOA's Red Carpet. My name is Jackson Vungani. Thank you so much for joining us each week right here on Red Carpet. We bring you the latest in. In other news, the Senegalese opposition figure Osman Sonko is in intensive care 19 days into a political hunger strike. The politician was hospitalized August 6th, a week after being placed on detention awaiting trial on charges of calling for insurrection, conspiracy against the state and other alleged crimes. The Rwandan genocide suspect and former Rwandan police officer Fulgens Kaishima, 62, appeared in a South African magistrate court on Friday after being rearrested Tuesday in response to a United Nations tribunal's request for his extradition to Tanzania to stand trial at its genocide court. He is accused of orchestrating the killing of approximately 2,000 Tutsi refugees. And China's foreign ministry has confirmed that President Xi Jinping will attend next week's summit of the BRICS nations in Johannesburg uh, to be followed by a state visit to South Africa. The Chinese leader is set to co-chair the China-Africa leader's dialogue with his South African counterpart, Cyril Lamaposa. U.S. President Joe Biden has no significant Democratic challenger for re-election, making him almost certain to be the Democratic Party nominee. Viewers Veronica Balderos Iglesias uh, reports on why Biden has been mostly unchallenged in his bid for a second term. 
Some Democrats in Arlington, Virginia, are wary about 80-year-old Joe Biden becoming his party's nominee for the 2024 presidential election. The main reason? His age. He has knowledge that's vast, but as an effective president, his actions are a little slower than they should be. I think a lot of people are hoping for other you know, people to um, kind of stand up and be more, be promoted by the party. I think a challenge is, is healthy, you know, sometimes that's what people need to like elevate their uh, performance. So far, only two fringe candidates are poised to challenge the incumbent president in the primaries. Spiritual activist Mary Ann Williamson and environmental lawyer Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Neither one, if history is any indicator, are going to be around when the dust settles. The only way that we might actually see a viable candidate emerge other than Biden is if Biden actually decides to step down. That's because beating a sitting president for a party's nomination is hard, historians say. They have unparalleled name recognition. They have sources of funding that are not available to challengers. And of course, experience in campaigning and in governing. Jimmy Carter was a weak president in 1980, drew a challenge from Senator Ted Kennedy. Uh, George Bush Sr. was a very weak president, drew a challenge in 1992. So it has happened. But again, it's rare for those challengers to win. Also in Biden's favor, it appears he will again face former President Donald Trump as the Republican Party nominee, making it likely that Democratic voters will rally behind him next year, says political analyst Pope Mac McCorkle. But while things look like that's where it's headed, again, because of the age uh, of both of them, because of Trump's legal problems, we could see a lot of change. Uh, as an outside possibility between now and, and election day on 2024. With more than a year until the general election, analysts caution the race is still very early and say that opinion polls published now about the presidential hopefuls have zero predictive value for November 2024. Veronica Valderas Iglesias, VOA News, Arlington, Virginia. Well, it's time for our entertainment report, and joining us now is Heather Maxwell, host of VOA's Music Time in Africa radio program, with news on some musicians from Sierra Leone, and they performed for her. Yes. Hello, 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 Heather. Yes, hi, Vincent. Four members of the experimental music platform Telem Uncommon Sounds stopped by VOA earlier this week for an exciting live studio performance. They just wrapped up a tour with Silk Road's Global Musicians Workshop at the New England Consortium Conservatory in Boston, the first group ever from Sierra Leone to participate in the program. Then they came to Washington to be on my radio program, Music Time in Africa. Let's check them out. Hi, everybody. My name is Kate Krontiris, um, and this next song that I'm, we're going to sing is a song that I wrote about ghost trees, which are trees that have no chlorophyll, so they should be dead, but they're alive because the forest around them sends them sugars through the root system. And I saw a lot of parallels with our human societies. So enjoy this next song, Ghost Trees. <laughs>
So that is Telem Uncommon Sounds from Sierra Leone. You can watch the entire performance, including a discussion with the artists and the studio audience on my YouTube channel, Music Time in Africa. Vincent, back to you. Still feeling the music, sort of. <laughs> Heather, thank you very much. Now be sure to join Heather, uh, Heather's Entertainment Reports every Friday right here on Africa 54. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us in Washington, have a great weekend. <laughs>